ready to worship you. Thank you, God, for our testimony, Lord. Thank you for what you have done in our life and what you are going to continue to do. We praise your name. darkness run for cover but the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven I've been leaving signs and wonders I have resurrection power still the miracle that I just can't get over this morning, we are going to be intentionally praying for the Lord to send us a children's minister, someone who would coordinate um, the volunteers for children's ministry and lead that ministry. Will you pray for that with me this morning? Father God, I thank you that you have planted within our hearts a burden to minister to children. I thank you, Father, that you are leading us in a direction to prepare the space and to prepare prepare the volunteers to minister to the children and the families of our community. Father God, we want to intentionally pray for you to send us a 
person that would lead that ministry, to be a children's minister here at Church Alive that would have a burden and a calling on their life by you, Lord, to minister to these families. Lord, we pray now that wherever they are, that you would begin to speak to their heart, Lord, that you would move upon them and equip them for the ministry that you are calling them to. Father, we pray for an anointing over this individual, Lord, that you would anoint them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, Lord, that they would find a deep relationship with you, Lord, that they would find intimacy with you, that they would hear your voice, and that they would know clearly how you are leading and guiding them, Father. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive this harvest, Lord, this um, bountiful harvest that you are going to bring in of children into our church, Lord, that you would help us to be welcoming to children and to families, Lord, that you would help us to be welcoming to children's ministers in our church, Lord, that your name might be glorified and that lives might be changed by the power of your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Oh, Jesus, we want to be more aware of you this morning. We invite you, Holy Spirit, into this place. Father, we pray that you would open every part of our spiritual hearts and eyes to receive you this morning, Lord, that we would welcome you, Lord, that every distraction and every burden and everything that we've carried into the house this morning, that it would have to take a back seat to the awareness of your presence. Father, we ask for more of your spirit this morning. We ask for a greater revelation of who you are and that you would speak to us and move among us this morning. Jesus, our eyes are fixated solely on you this morning. We give you glory and honor in the house. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We are going to continue our time of worship in our offering, and it is so good to see each of you this morning at Church Alive. And with today being the third Sunday, we will be taking up our offering for um, our missions fund here at Church Alive, which does two things for us. It allows us to do outreach programs here in our local community, and it also allows us to support the work of the Lord that is going on in other countries throughout the world and our ministry partners that we have. And I wanted to share with you a scripture verse, Hebrews 13, verses 15 through 16. And it says, Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. The writer of Hebrews here identifies for the Christian believer that when we give sacrificially, we are worshiping the Lord. When we help those who are in need and those who have without, and we give to those out of the abundance of what we have, that we are worshiping the Lord in that, and we are giving a sacrifice of worship to the Lord. And so I encourage you to do that this morning through your giving. We have four ways that you can give today as the ushers are coming. They'll be passing the offering plate through the sanctuary. You can text 84321 for online giving. You can go to our website or Facebook app, or you can mail a check to our clerk and treasurer, Sister Judy Hatton. Will you pray over the offering with me this morning? Father God, I thank you for the ability that we have to be in your house today. Thank you for your spirit that has Um, shown up in our time of worship, Lord. We pray that your spirit would be upon this time of giving as we continue to worship, that you would move upon each individual heart, what it is that you want them to give, Lord, and that you would receive this offering into your storehouses and that you would multiply it for the work of your kingdom, that many lives would come to know you through our sacrifice of praise today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. you for your giving. I'm going to ask that you be standing this morning and take your Bible with you as we turn to scripture to read the word of the Lord. We're continuing our series on the life of King David, and today we will specifically be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. And the title of my sermon this morning is David, a king in waiting. David, a king in waiting. 1 Samuel chapter 18, starting in verse 1. It says, After David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David, together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Whatever Saul asked David to do, 
David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. When the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand, and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your word this morning. I pray that you would speak so clearly to us today. Father, we need to hear from your spirit. We need to hear directly from the throne room of heaven. This sanctuary is your home. We are your people. Inhabit our gathering today and speak to us clearly what you want us to hear from your word today, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Waiting is not something that humans naturally do very well. I think if we were to take a poll this morning, most of us would agree with the fact that we do not like waiting. We see this in humanity in many places that we go. One of the most intriguing to me of places to watch people wait is at the airport. I don't know uh, if very many of you have taken uh, plane rides, but when you get to the airport and you go through security and you get to your gate, many airlines have a specific boarding process that you have a ticket that will tell you when you can load on the airplane. But as soon as those come over the intercoms, people start lining up in front of the gate and they will often block the path of the aisleway of other people who are trying to get through to get to their gate. And the people standing in the line, they can look at their ticket and know that they have been um, designated as the last group to get on to the airplane, but they're going to get their spot in line close to that gate. Likewise, the people who have the ticket that designates them to be first on the airplane are suddenly filled with anxiety by everybody else lining up where they're supposed to be, and it becomes a chaotic situation because people do not like to wait their turn. I see this uh, in my own daughter. Um, One of her favorite things right now are golden Oreo cookies. And every night at dinner, she wants the golden Oreo cookie before the meal. And Grace does not wait for the cookie well. We are praying for patience in our daughter. And um, I ask that you would pray along with us that the Lord would instill that in her. But when she wants the cookie, she goes to the pantry and she bangs on the door And when we get the golden Oreo package out, she begins to giggle and she goes, yay, because that is what she has been waiting for. I myself am not naturally a good waiter. Several, uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Miranda's parents were in town and we had the opportunity to go see her grandmother in Elizabethtown. And on the way back, we stopped at a Sonic drive-thru um, to get a snack. And do you know that from the moment our tires in the vehicle hit the parking lot of Sonic to the moment they got us our food was 30 minutes. And that did not sit well with your pastor because this is a fast food establishment and there was nothing that was fast about the service at the Sonic drive through that day. Humanity by and large does not do waiting very well. And these are some trivial examples, but there are much more serious times in our lives where we have to wait, specifically when we're waiting on the Lord for prayers to be answered 
Perhaps we've been praying about a need or a desire for years and years and years, and we are waiting for the Lord to answer that which we have prayed and asked for. In our personal lives, maybe it's waiting for the job promotion. We've put in the time, we've put in the good deeds, and we are waiting for our time to come to get that promotion. Or we're waiting for that loved one to be saved, that our hearts have been poured out before the Lord day after day and week after week, that they would come to know the Lord as Savior. Waiting is difficult. Waiting is not a fun experience, but According to scripture, there are some specific things that should characterize the believers of God when we are in seasons of waiting. And we can learn about this from doing our life study of King David, because David was a man who had to wait a lot in his life. But when David was waiting, one of the things that he did was he waited in patience. When we look at our opening scripture today in chapter 18, verse 5, It says that whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. You see, in the days immediately following David's anointing as the king of Israel, immediately following Samuel coming to the home and anointing him and the spirit vitally empowering David, do you know where he immediately probably went right back to? the field with the sheep that he had been serving. Because many theologians identify for us that it was probably somewhere around 15 years between the time of David's anointing by the prophet Samuel and his actual coronation as the king of Israel. He was given this promise as a young man, you will be king over Israel, but you have to wait quite some time. And in fact, David was not even given the specific amount of time that he was to wait. He did not know at what season in his life he would get to experience this promise from the Lord. All he knew was that he had to wait. And David fascinates me for many reasons. But one of the things that has always intrigued me about this man of God is the patience with which he conducted himself in the time between his anointing and his coronation. You see, had it been me that was anointed to be king over Israel, I would have wanted Samuel to immediately take me to the palace, right? You showed up at my doorstep. You pulled me out of the field. You told me that the spirit of the Lord was identifying me as the next king of Israel. Okay, let's get in the caravan. Let's go to the palace. Show me my throne room. Show me all of the riches and the glory and the lavishness of getting to live in the palace. Show me my many servants and all of the wonderful food that will be cooked for me. Let me step into the glory of being the king. But this was not the case for David, because immediately following his anointing, he went back into the field. Sometime later, as we looked at last week, late David would go on to defeat the giant Goliath on the battlefield. So as the readers, maybe we're thinking perhaps this is the point where David is going to receive his official promotion to being the king of Israel. He just did what no other man in the nation had the courage or the faith in God to do. He defeated a nine-foot giant Philistine in the name of the Lord. But even this was not the moment where David would be promoted to king. In fact, It was in this moment where David made a significant transition in his life to not becoming the king, but to serving the king. You see, David, after his defeat of Goliath, was put in the direct vicinity of that which rightfully belonged to him. But he had to serve the man who was sitting in the throne that had been promised to him by the very Spirit of God. And never once do we see David become resentful or angry about this reality. We do not see David go into the palace to serve King Saul and become bitter and hateful and angry towards King Saul. No, we see the exact opposite, that David served the king with faithfulness and with obedience and with patience. And I don't pretend to understand the timeline that God works on 
But I do know that oftentimes we struggle to wait 15 minutes for the Lord to answer a prayer, let alone having to wait 15 years for the promise to be fulfilled. I don't understand the timeline that God always works with, but I know that he has given us promises in scripture that instruct us on how we are to wait. The prophet Isaiah said it like this in Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And I love how the King James Version says it. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You see, this scripture identifies for the reader that waiting on the Lord is not a position of passiveness. Waiting on the Lord is not something that we do and we just twiddle our thumbs and we bemoan the fact that we're waiting on the promises of God. It actually says that when we trust in the Lord and we purposefully and intentionally and patiently wait on him, that God renews our strength, that he places his own strength within us so that we can wait and endure every season without growing weary, without growing tired, without growing fatigued, but that when we trust and wait in the Lord, we receive an extra portion of his strength. Surely this is what David experienced day after day after day after day when he stepped foot into the throne room, not as the king, but as a servant. When he stepped in front of the throne and he was not the one being bowed to, but he was the one that was doing the bowing. When he stepped into the palace and he was not the one who was getting to issue the commands, but he was the one that was receiving the commands. David waited patiently on the Lord and God gave him strength in this season of his life. We know this because this scripture says, whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. There is a lot of weight in that one small verse Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully, meaning that every task that was given to David, he did it in obedience. He did it with an immediacy. He did it with a willingness and a servant's heart that it doesn't matter what the king asks me to do, even though I'm supposed to be the king right now, I'm going to be obedient. And whatever he asks me to do, no matter how glamorous or unglamorous, no matter how prestigious or shameful this task might be, I am going to serve the king because that is who is on the throne right now. And God has placed me here first as a servant. I'm waiting to be king. David served the king with patience and with obedience. But it also says that David was successful in everything that he did. And I don't know about you, but there have been very few seasons in my life where I could say that phrase, that Stetson was successful in everything that he did. In fact, I can point to some things in this last week that Stetson tried to do and he wasn't very successful in doing. The fact that scripture records that everything Saul asked David to do, that he was able to do it successfully, is a testament to the fact that the spirit of the Lord was giving David strength, just as Isaiah 40 and 31 says. And what it means for us today is that regardless of the season of waiting that we are in, if we will trust in the Lord, if we will be obedient with what is right in front of us, we will begin to practice the same patience and the same trust with which David exhibited in this season of his life. And we receive the promise of scripture that we will receive the strength from God. I don't know about you, but I need the strength of the Lord. I need the special supernatural power of Jesus to get through my day to day because there are a lot of things that I face in the day in and the day out that I do not have the strength or the ability or the patience to get through on my own. But when we trust in the Lord and just imagine it, having to go into that palace every single day wondering, is today the day? 
where I get my promotion, where the promise that Samuel gave to me and anointed me that I will be king over Israel. Is this the day? But even if it isn't, I will serve the king with patience and with obedience. You see, Christians should be characterized by uncommon patience. Those who believe in the, in the Lord and have received his spirit should be identified by the radical and unexplainable patience that resides within us, that we can face a multitude of situations and yet have the peace and the patience of the Lord within us to wait and endure that situation. Christians should not be characterized by the opposite of not being patient, of being quick to fly off the handle or being quick to respond in anger. Scripture tells us that we are to be slow to speak and quick to listen. We are to be characterized by uncommon Patience, patience that the world does not have, patience that the world can't understand, patience that the world cannot describe. We who are the sons and daughters of the Most High God should be filled with patience in every season of waiting. But not only did David wait in patience, David waited in peace. As we continue in this passage of Scripture in verses 9 through 11, It says, so from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The very next day, the very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul, and he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had a spear in his hand, and he suddenly hurled it at David intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. This short passage of scripture quickly identifies for us one of the key downfalls of King Saul. It is almost impossible to study the life of David without also simultaneously studying the life of Saul because they were complete opposites in their disposition and their relationship to the Lord. It shows us in this passage of scripture that one of the downfalls of Saul was his jealousy of David. He became jealous of the man who was serving him, who was the rightful king of Israel, but was coming into the palace every day to serve him in obedience. He was still seated on the throne. He was still the king of Israel. He still had all the authority and the ability to command David to do whatever he wanted him to do, but the king became jealous of the servant. It clearly identifies for us as well that it was jealousy that preceded Saul being afflicted by a tormenting spirit, which caused him to rave like a madman. It is no coincidence that Scripture tells us that Saul kept a jealous eye on David, and the very next day that a tormenting spirit came upon Saul. His choice to be jealous of David was what opened the door for himself to experience affliction from this tormenting spirit. You see, I fully believe that if Saul would have just been peaceful in his own position, if he would have just been resolute in his own relationship with the Lord and never chose jealousy, that he would not have received this tormenting spirit from the Lord. But because he chose jealousy, he opened the door for his own personal affliction. Imagine being in the palace that day. One day, King Saul is sane. One day, he knows what he's doing. But the very next day, it says that he began to rave in his house like a madman. Well, what was the house of the king but the palace of all of Israel? So the very next day, the king, who is supposed to be leading the entire nation of Israel, is raving in his house like a madman. When I see that, I think about screaming and unintelligible words and kicking and hitting and running around and not being able to string a coherent thought together. One day, King Saul is saying, And the next, he is literally insane because of his jealousy of David. It was jealousy that was the catalyst 
Jealousy became the gateway for this tormenting spirit, for at its root, jealousy is sin. This had long been identified for the children of Israel. When God had given Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, he clearly identified for the children of Israel in Exodus 20 and 17. You must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. The word here that is used is covet, which means to yearn desperately to possess something that belongs to someone else, also known as jealousy. To yearn desperately that I don't want to just have blessing for myself, but I want exactly what you have so that I can possess what you have and you can be on the other side of this coin and go without what it is that you have. Saul was yearning to possess that which David had gotten a hold of, the Spirit of God. Yet instead of humbly pursuing God for himself, Saul jealously wanted to possess the portion that had been specifically given to David. It wasn't enough for Saul to pursue the Lord for himself. He wanted what David had and for David to be without because that's what jealousy is. Jealousy is not an ambition for us to receive from the Lord for ourselves, but jealousy is really rooted in the desire to steal what belongs to someone else. I like what you have and I want what you have and I don't want you to have what you have. This is the spirit that Saul approached David with, and it is what opened the door for this tormenting spirit. And isn't it just like humanity? And it's not that I want something for myself, but I want what you have so I can have it, and you can't. It was this intentional act of jealousy that opened the door for the downfall of Saul. And it stands as a stark warning for everyone, whether you believe in God or do not believe in God, who would read this passage and understand that jealousy leads to affliction. Jealousy leads to being tormented, whether it's by a spirit or it's just our own tormenting of ourself. This lack of contentment is a tormenting experience to go through, that I just need what somebody else has. I just need more. I can't be at peace because I have to have what everybody else has. This is a terrible way to live your life. And the juxtaposition juxtaposition of Saul and David is startling. The one in power becomes jealous of the one who has no power, while the one who was rightfully king of Israel served the man who was raving like a madman, and he did it in patience, and he did it in peace. The king was jealous of the servant, while the man who was anointed to be king never once entertained the option to be jealous of Saul, because he was waiting in patience, and he was waiting in peace. By jealousy yearning for what David had, Saul not only prevented himself from getting closer to God, he further separated himself from the Holy Spirit. And that's the danger of jealousy, that it doesn't just stop us in our tracks in our relationship with the Lord, but it actually causes us to turn our backs on the Lord and actively walk away from him. When we choose the emotion and the desire of jealousy, we are actively choosing not to pursue the Holy Spirit. We must know surely this morning that jealousy always separates us from the heart of God. Whether it is jealousy of someone else's possessions, jealousy of someone's spouse, jealousy of someone's achievements, jealousy of someone's wealth or someone's giftings and talents or their personality, jealousy always moves us further away from the heart of God. And as Christians, we can be really sly about our jealousy, right? Christians are some of the best sinners in the world. 
because we know the book. We know it front and back. We know what we identify as the loopholes or the gray areas. So sometimes when, je- when Christians are jealous, it comes out like this. Oh, they're just so lucky that fill in the blank happened to them. Or why do they deserve blank when I don't have it? Or I wish I could have what they have. This is often the phrases that come out of the mouths of Christians when we are beginning to fall into the trap of jealousy. When we look at other people and we want what they have, it is a red flag that we are beginning to seep into the realm of jealousy. And we must be honest about it when it happens or it will begin to wreak its havoc in our lives. You see, true contentment only comes in pursuit of, of the Holy Spirit. So when those emotions begin to arise within us that I see what somebody else has and I want that, that's a a warning sign for me that I need to pursue the Lord a little bit more. Instead of being so concerned about what other people have, I need to make sure that my prayer life is correct. Instead of being so concerned with what's going on in the lives of other people, I need to make sure that I'm studying the word of God for myself. Instead of being so caught up in what everybody else has going on in their lives, I need to make sure that I get into a place of worship so that I can get alone with the spirit of God and he can begin to help me be content in the season of waiting so that we are filled with peace instead of jealousy. And not only did Saul's jealousy lead him to be tormented by an evil spirit, it led him to attempt murder, breaking another one of the Ten Commandments. For the passage says, Saul had a spear in his hand, and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to a wall. Now, I have never held a spear in my hand. I've never really seen someone hold a spear in their hand. But I imagine that if you have a spear in your hand and you throw it, you are throwing it with the intention that it is going to pierce something on the other end of that spear. It is what it is intended for. It would be the equivalent to someone having a gun and pointing it at someone else and pulling the trigger. The only intention in doing so is to take the life of the other person that is on the other side of this act. So Saul becomes so jealous of a servant that he actually tried to murder him in his own palace throne room. But notice what David did. And what I find so peculiar about David, it simply says, but David escaped him twice. Now, again, I've never had a spear thrown at me, but I like to think that if I'm faced with a fight or flight situation, that the manliness in me will choose the fight. Right? If you come at me with a spear or you come at me with intention to harm me or my family, I am likely to try and fight back and to defend myself. And if I have to, vanquish you instead of myself being vanquished. This is what I would do, but it is not at all what David did. When David was in the throne room of the king, serving the man who was sitting in the throne that would rightfully be his, and the king tried to murder him, David did not choose to retaliate. He simply chose to escape. David chose to respond with an attempt on his life in peace. It was the most peaceful thing that David could do. He simply got out of the palace. He did not engage with the raving madman of a king. He did not try to fight back. And surely David, this shepherd who had defeated both lion and bear in the field and had faced a nine-foot giant in the valley of Elah could have defeated this insane old king in the palace throne room. But instead of retaliating and fighting back against the king and killing him after he just tried to murder him, he escapes in peace. And when I read this, I'm flabbergasted because this is not the reaction of humanity. And oftentimes, this is not even the reaction of 
Christians because we love to be people of peace until people come against us, and then we identify that as a moment of what we like to call righteous anger. And because they took the first step in aggression towards me, I'm now righteous in my anger or my retaliation against them. But I don't see that in Scripture. I see over and over and over God calling the people of God to be people of peace. I see him instructing his people, just stand still and let me fight for you. If you'll just trust in me, I will give you the victory. David chose peace instead of engaging the king. But then I keep reading, and I see another word that just jumps off the page at me. One word. Twice. Twice. David escaped the king twice. Do you know what David would have had to do to be put in a second scenario where the king hurled a spear at him again? He would have had to go back into the throne room and begin to serve the king again. Because David was a man of peace. He was a man of waiting in patience. So you mean to tell me that after the king, who is sitting on David's throne, attempts to murder him, that he went back into the throne room to obediently and patiently and humbly serve the man who just tried to kill him? Yes, that is exactly what David did. And when the king again tried to take his life, David escaped instead of engaging because he was a man of peace. Some Christians struggle to forgive a brother or sister who, in the faith who is remorseful and asks for forgiveness. Yet here is a man who forgave and served a man who attempted to kill him because he was filled with peace. And David didn't have to be. Surely there were other people on the scene that were already recognizing that David would be the next king of Israel. Certainly there were people in the palace who understood that Saul had completely lost his marbles and that David had done nothing to deserve an attempt on his life. Surely if David would have responded in violence and aggression and taking Saul's life that day, there would have been people in the palace that supported him because they were watching everything unfold with a front row seat. But David chose peace, which means that Christians should be not only characterized by uncommon patience, but we should be characterized by uncommon peace. Christians should have more peace in our hearts than anyone else. We should be at more peace with our family members than those who do not know the Lord. We should be at peace with other Christians and other believers. We should be at peace with Republicans and Democrats. We should be at peace with sinners and with Christians. We should be at peace with people who are sober and people who are drunk. We should be at peace with people who are addicted to drugs. We should be at peace with people who are dealing with the temptations of homosexuality because we are called to peace. And this is actually the entire story of the gospel, that those who did not deserve peace, that those who should have been responded to with aggression and with death were extended the gift of peace, were extended the gift of grace by the very creator of the world, that when Jesus was betrayed by Judas and he was taken before the high priest and the Sanhedrin, he was a man who was filled with peace peace, when they pulled at his beard and they spit in his face and they stripped him naked and they beat him and they whipped him and they pierced his side with a spear, Jesus was filled with peace so that he could extend peace to you and I. So how could we do anything other in our walk with the Lord than be at peace with everyone? This is not an easy thing to do. Surely there are times where being unpeaceful is the more fulfilling response. That if I could just give them a little 
peace in my mind. If I could just show them a little bit of how they've been treating me, then they would understand how awful they are. But scripture says, respond in peace. Christians should be characterized by uncommon peace, especially in seasons of waiting. And lastly, this morning, David waited in preparation. Shortly after the passage that we have looked at today in chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, Saul sent soldiers to David's house with one purpose, find him in his sleep, in his home, in his bed, and kill him. Saul, at this point, was actually David's father-in-law because David had married his daughter, Michael. Yet Saul and his jealousy began to hate David so much, wanted him dead so much that it wasn't enough for him to attempt to take David's life alone. He began to use the resources of the palace, the resources of the kingdom to attempt to take David's life. And one of the reasons that I love studying David's life is because we have the book of 1 Samuel but we also have the book of Psalms, many of which David wrote. And if you study the Bible in chronological order, you will see Psalms pop up that David wrote throughout his life. And one of the Psalms that David wrote in his life is Psalm 59. And it happens, scripture identifies it in the book of Psalm that David wrote this about the night that Saul sent soldiers to his house to kill, to kill him. So Psalm 59, starting in verse 1, says, Rescue me from my enemies, O God. Protect me from those who have come to destroy me. Rescue me from these criminals. Save me from these murderers. They have set an ambush for me. Fierce enemies are out there waiting, Lord. Though I have not sinned or offended them, I have done nothing wrong, yet they prepare to attack me. Wake up, see what is happening and help me. O Lord God of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, wake up and punish those hostile nations. Show no mercy to wicked traitors. See, David begins this psalm by pleading with the Lord and identifying for God what was going on in his life as if God wasn't already aware. He says, God, wake up. There are people out here that are trying to kill me. There are criminals all around me. They are literally setting traps for me. They are trying to murder me. And I'm trying to be patient, Lord. I'm trying to be a man of peace. I am trying to trust in the promises and wait on the strength that is supposed to come from your spirit. But I need you to show up and defend me, God. I need you to arrive on the scene because people are trying to kill me. David was desperately crying out to God. And isn't that just what we do when we get desperate in our seasons of waiting? God, do you even know what's going on in my life right now? Do you even see all of the hardships and all of the trouble and all of the tragedy and all of the broken hearts and all of the backstabbing and all of the lies and all of the waiting that I am going through? God, if you would just wake up in heaven and show up in my life, I would really appreciate it if you could do that right now. I don't know. I'll just be vulnerable. I've talked to the Lord like that before. I've been in those moments of desperation where I just had to cry out and let everything out before the Lord. And guess what? His shoulders are broad enough to take it. He is secure in his position as God Almighty and Father of the universe to not be shaken when we come to him with our needs and our requests. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 11, 28 and 30, come to me. All you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Jesus clearly tells us, oh, I can handle your frustration. I can handle your burden. I can handle handle the season of waiting that you are going through. I can handle your disappointment and your frustration. Lay it all on me and I will take the burden and I will give you peace. I will take the burden and I will give you patience. I will take the burden and I will give you strength. I will take the burden and I will give you rest. If you'll just give me everything that you're carrying right now, I will exchange it for you for a gift of peace and rest because I am humble and I am gentle and I am a good shepherd over my people. This is the heart of the Father for his people. And Jesus does not call us to stay in the frustration when we give him our burdens. Because look at how David's words change by the end of chapter 59. He says, but as for me, as for For me, I will sing about your power. Oh, hallelujah. Each morning, I will sing with joy about your unfailing love. For you have been my refuge, a place of safety when I am in distress. Oh, my strength, to you I sing praises. For you, oh God, are my refuge, the God who shows me unfailing love. Yes, David started this psalm by laying everything out before the Lord and saying, God, I need you to wake up. But by the end of the psalm, he was saying, but as for me, I choose to worship the Lord. Every morning that I get up and Saul is still trying to kill me, I will sing with joy in my heart for you, oh God, have been my unfailing refuge. In the good days and in the bad days, you have been faithful to me, oh God. I will sing with joy and I will sing with gratitude because you are an unfailing love. You are an unfailing help over my life. And God, I trust in you. I will worship you. Oh, hallelujah. David did not wait until he got to the palace to praise God for his unfailing faithfulness. He praised him in the middle of the night when he had to get up and escape his house and run for his life. Oh God, tomorrow morning I will wake and sing with joy. I will praise you even though the murderers and the criminals are hunting me down. I will still worship you. And I know that I've talked about worship a lot lately, but I think God is really trying to get our attention in this area because worship is a choice. Worship does not happen by accident. Worship is not passive. Worship is a choice to engage that regardless of what is going on in my life, I will sing, I will sing, I will sing for joy, for God is worthy, he is worthy, he is worthy to be praised. David waited in preparation. He praised in the waiting. He worshiped in the waiting. He gave God thanks in the waiting before the prayer was ever answered. God, I still choose to worship you. I still choose. As for me, I'm going to worship the Lord. It echoes the words of Joshua to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the world serve the Lord. It doesn't matter what the world does. It doesn't matter what society does. As for me, I'm going to serve God. As for me, I'm going to worship the Lord. As for me, I will be faithful to the Lord in every season of my life because I can sing of his unfailing love. And I know sometimes it doesn't feel like we even have the breath in our lungs to worship the Lord. But you know what popped up in my Bible app this week? Was a passage of scripture that says, when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for us. When we don't know how to worship, all we have to do is say, God, give me a song. 
God, help me to worship you. God, help me to trust in you. And the Holy Spirit, as we're waiting on him, will give us that strength that it will feel like we have mounted the wings like eagles and we will no longer be weary. We will no longer be at the point of fainting or giving up, but we will be renewed with the strength of the Lord. And before we know it, what was a struggle to praise God in will be an exuberant praise. And people will be coming up to you left and right saying, I don't know how you can be at such peace right now. I don't know how you can worship the Lord in the midst of your situation. And that's when you get to say, it is the Jesus all over me. It is because I have trusted in the one who I know is faithful. And we can worship the Lord. I'm going to ask that you be standing all over the church this morning. The invitation this morning is simple. If you're in a season of waiting or you have a need, I want to pray with you this morning. If you need the Lord to give you strength, I want to pray with you this morning because we have promise after promise after promise of scripture that when we seek the Lord, he will meet with us and he will give us exactly what we need. So Miranda is going to sing and lead us in worship. And if you have a need this morning, I invite you to step out and receive prayer and allow the Holy Spirit to meet you right where you are.